All right, let's talk about convolutional neural networks. So let's look at a normal feedforward neural network, and we will see the differences between the convolutional networks and feedforward neural networks. In a normal feedforward neural network, we have an input layer with a bunch of neurons. We have hidden layers, could be one or more than one, and where we also have some neurons, and we have an output layer. And all of these neurons in a feedforward neural network are connected with each other. And then we have convolutional neural networks. They are a little bit more complicated than to be able to show uh, on one image. But basically the idea is that whatever your input is, let's say it's an image, you put them through some layers again. But these layers are called filters this time. And so basically you do some sort of transformation to the image or the input value that you have, and then you get an output. So one of the main differences is that in a feedforward neural network, if we have an image to be able to put it inside the neural network and get an output, we would have to get all the pixel values of this image and then flatten them to be one long array. So let's say this is a colorful image, but let's say it was a black and white image and it was 28 to 28. Then we would have 784 pixel values. So then we would have to have 784 uh, input neurons. And then those input neurons, these values of the input neurons will be passed to the hidden layer and then to the output layer. The difference is with convolutional neural networks, you can just pass your image as it is, as in, in its 2D form or 3D form even, if it's a colorful image like this one inside the RNN and then the RNN does its magic and then you get your prediction classification or whatever that, you, that is that you're trying to do. So this might look just like a practicality difference and you might say, okay, what, yeah, what is the worst thing about just having a lot of input neurons in our input layer and feed forward neural networks? Well, the problem is the dimensions get really big. So if you have a feed forward neural network and you want to feed it to, feed to it a 100 to 100 pixel image, and by the way, this image already is bigger than 100 to 100 pixels, but let's say a small 100 to 100 pixel image, then that means you would have to have 10,000 neurons in your input layer. And let's say on the next hidden layer, you have only one hidden layer, and in that hidden layer, you have only 100 neurons, you already will have more than 1 million parameters that you need to train. And that is a lot of parameters to train. And you know that's only one hidden layer. You very likely will need more than one hidden layer and more than 100 neurons per hidden layer. CNNs don't have this many parameters to train because they use what we're going to learn are called a partially connected layers and weight sharing. And that's why they are able to handle even bigger images with less weights. How this happens is that, as we said, there are filters in the CNN architecture in every layer. And these filters, let's say in this image, is that little square. And luckily in this square, we only have one set of weights. And this square is actually taken through the whole image one by one, step by step. So by using just one small square of weights, so not one weight per pixel, but just enough pixels to fit in this little square, you will be able to analyze the whole picture. And by doing that, you create a smaller version or a slightly transformed version of this image, but we will see more about that in a second. So there are two different types of things that you can pass through an image with CNNs. One of them is called the pooling layers and the other one is called filters. First we will see how filters work and then we will see how pooling layers work. So filters basically are a matrix, like our image also is, where there tend to be smaller um, filters or smaller matrices with some values in them. These values could be anything. And then what we do is, as we talked about just now, we pass this filter, we pass this little matrix over our image. And then how we calculate the output is that we multiply the numbers that correspond on top of each other. So if we take this little matrix, paste it on top of here, what we have is one times zero, zero times 10, one times zero and zero times zero. So the output is zero. And if we go to the next step, we're going to do the same thing just by sliding it one step to the right. And what we'll be doing will be 10 times one, zero times zero, zero times one, and zero times zero. And that means when you sum them all up, we have 10. Basically, you can keep going like this and then you traverse the whole image. There are different qualities of these filters though. Of course, you don't always have to just go one step to the side or one step down. 
This is called a stride and you can set different strides for your filters. So if you set your stride to be two, what's going to happen is you're going to jump two uh, places to the right or two places to the next uh, place. So what's going to happen is if our filter is here, if our stride is two, then we're going to jump to the next two because we're jumping two uh, places in our image or photo. And that will apply both to going sideways and also going down. Um, but of course you might not always fit perfectly. So right, we have six pixels side by side here and our stride is two and we're fitting perfectly in just one width of the image. But what if you don't fit the perfect width of the image? So let's say we have a seven by seven pixel image and we set our stride to be three and our filter, our filter size is also three. So first I get this, these numbers and I apply my filter there and then I jump three uh, places. But now if I jump three more places, I've actually run out of image to analyze. So at that point we have something else called padding that's coming into play. So with padding, what you do is if your stride and your um, filter size is not compatible with your image, you can pad your values or you can pad your uh, image pixel values with zeros all around it to be able to make it fit this stride and filter size. So then if we just add zeros all over the image, then we can use a filter size of three with the stride of three also. So then I can just easily jump around without running out of image. So these filters are not random, of course. As you go further and deeper inside your CNN, your filters are going to be able to determine things that are a little bit more high level. So if earlier in the levels you can find dark spots or certain lines, so for example, vertical lines, horizontal lines, and things like that, and then further in the network, maybe you'll be able to find a nose, an eye, or a eyebrow. And later towards the end of the network, you will be able to actually recognize or apply your filters to recognize faces or parts of faces, for example. But how does that really, what does that look like when you, let's say a vertical line filter, what does it look like? So in this image, let's say we have a line here, right? So these are um, high or brighter values and these are darker values of zeros. So that would mean, let's say this is just a small part of an image, that means that there is a line here because we are going from bright colors to dark colors. And this is a filter that will show us if there is a, a vertical line or not. So in this case, if we run this whole filter through our image, what we're going to get as the resulting matrix is this. So basically what it's telling us is that there is a line on the left side or the left half of this image. Similarly, if we have the line lying on the other side, we would again have a similar thing telling us that there is a line that is lying on the right side of the image. And if you don't care about whether the line goes from a, a darker color to brighter color or brighter color to darker color, you can also just take the absolute values of these um, resulting matrices to tell you just if there is a line or not. But by having the minus values here, you are making a distinction between whether you're going from dark to bright or bright to dark. And here is what it will look like on an actual image. So this is the original image that we have. And if we apply a filter to it that recognizes vertical edges, this is what we get as a resulting matrix. And this is what we get as a resulting matrix is if we apply the mat um, filter to it that recognizes the horizontal edges. So as you can see here, we see all the vertical edges and some edges that are partially vertical, partially horizontal, of course. Uh, so we see more of the vertical features of the image here. Whereas here we see more of the horizontal features of this image, like this line, the lines here. So basically with different filters, we are able to capture different qualities of an image. So, you know, let's say this is a vertical filter and this is a horizontal filter, but you might say, okay, then how do I, what kind of filter do I apply to my image to find circles or to find, I don't know, a nose, a dog's ear, a cat's tail? How does that even work? Well, actually, these are not things that you specifically write down. These examples were only to show you what it might look like, what your filters might look like to find uh, vertical lines or horizontal lines. But more advanced images or more advanced patterns that you want to find in your uh, data Th those filters are going to be learned. Those are basically, a filter is basically the weights of the network, the parameters of the network. They need to be trained, they need to be learned during the training process of your convolutional neural network. 
So just like we initialize the weights and biases of a feed-forward deep neural network, we again initialize the biases and the weights, weights being the filters of a convolutional neural network and let the training process update them to give the best results. Next up is the pooling layers. So pooling layers have the goal to subsample the input image in order to reduce its size. So they do not have any uh, weights in there. They do not have anything that needs to be trained or updated. Their only goal is to make the images a little bit more um, easy to deal with so that we have less computational load, uh, less memory usage, and less number of parameters at the end of the day. So it also helps with overfitting. There are two types of pooling layers. One of them is called max and the other one is called the average. And also one thing that is really important to note about the pooling layers is that they do not change with small translations to the image. So let me show you an example from this really good book that uh, I would recommend you also to go check out called Hands-On Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow. And here you can see if this, these are the original images, even if you change this structure that's in the middle of the image a little bit, if you shift it a little bit to the side, the pooling layers output is not going to change. And this is important to know. But okay, how does it actually work? What, what do we do in a pooling layer? So let's see that. So basically it is very similar to the filter layer. The only thing is that you do not do any calculations. If it's a max pooling layer, all you do is you go put your filter or window on top of the image and then you take the max number that is inside this little filter or inside this little window and then you put the image in the resulting matrix or put the value in the resulting matrix. Again, they could have different strides. Uh, so depending on the stride, you move your window to the next uh, side and then again you look inside and see which value is the highest value and then basically note it down. If you were doing it with an average pooling uh, layer, what you do is then you take the average of all the values that are inside this window. 